All right, last time we were taking a look at section 11.4, which is geometry in three dimensions, and we had looked at or talked about very, very briefly at the end that there were how many regular polyhedron? Does anybody remember? Without looking? Somebody said it. That's okay. What did you get, Melanie? Five? Yeah, there's five. There are five regular polyhedron. And we hadn't actually done much beyond just look at the pictures of them. And these were them. Do you remember that? Um, they all have information about them on the following slide, so we're going to take a look at that next. The first one is called a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron is made up of equilateral triangles, okay? Four equilateral triangles to be precise, so there are four faces because there's four triangles. Each of the triangles meets um, at the vertices, right? And when it, happen, when it happens that they meet at a vertice, three of the triangles meet there. So you'll have um, this shape that looks in the pictures over here on the right-hand side. It looks kind of like a triangular pyramid or something like that, or like a triangular, like if you're rolling dice, like a dice, but it's in triangle shapes instead. All right, we have a cube. The cube you're very familiar with because our dice are actually cubes. Um, or at least roughly speaking, um, they kind of round off the edges sometimes. But the faces are squares, and there's six of them, four around, one on top, one on bottom. And at every vertice, there's three faces that meets there. Think about the corners of your, of your cubes. There's three um, faces that meet there. The next one is called an octahedron. The octa is coming from the fact that there are eight faces, but the faces themselves are not octagons, okay? The faces themselves are equilateral triangles. So you have three equilateral triangles, I'm sorry, four, I meant to say it, four equilateral triangles, if you will, on the top, four equilateral triangles on the bottom, and then if you match them up, you end up with this particular shape, which is called an octahedron. And at every vertice, there's actually four triangles that meet there instead of just three like there was for the tetrahedron. Dodecahedron, I think we, somebody mentioned dodeca at one point in the past. Dodeca means 12. So dodecahedron is um, 12 faces, and the 12 faces um, are actually all pentagons. Okay, so they're regular pentagons, and at each vertice, you actually have three pentagons meeting. And hopefully you can see that okay with the picture as it's drawn in there. They're a little tricky to look at, but this piece, for instance, is not too bad right here. Whoops, that's white. Let me try a different color. Well, a prism has two parallel bases on the top and the bottom, and a tetrahedron doesn't. Yeah. Now, you could call it a triangular pyramid. That would be appropriate. It would be another name for it. Um, this one's a little bit more precise, though, because they're equilateral, whereas in a triangular pyramid, they wouldn't necessarily have to be equilaterals. So this one's a little bit more um, specific. Our last one is an icosahedron. Icosa means 20. Okay, so icosahedron has 20 faces. Again, they're equilateral triangles. And at each vertice, there's five triangles that meet there. So this picture is near impossible to look at, but if you look at maybe a corner, you might be able to see, oops, hang on. If you look at a corner, you might be able to see all five of the triangles meeting there, maybe. Two along the back and then three along the front. I can see them, but it's hard to see. Okay, so that one's an icosahedron. This might be a chart you want to write pieces of at least onto a note card, right? Um, let me talk briefly, and that way it's also recorded. I know Megan's been in my class before, but it's also recorded about the test on Monday. Um, I know a few of you have not had me in class before. There is a review out online. I encourage you to print that off. You are allowed to bring one note card with you to your test. You may use both sides of it, front and back. It must be handwritten, so for instance, you can't take this chart which is so fantastic, and then shrink it down with a copier. That's not acceptable, okay? If you want this chart, you need to handwrite it under your card, all right? Um, but you can write anything you want on that card, and you will leave the card with me when you're done with your test. Um, what else? There's a list of review problems on the um, review sheet. I'd encourage you to take a look at those. If that's all you do, you're probably going to be missing holes of things that you did. Um, because if that's all we would have done, we would have just done those problems to begin with. It's a good collection of them, but it's not all-inclusive. So if there's pieces of that that you need to go back and look at, I would encourage you to go back and look at your homework, go back and look at your notes from class, those kinds of things. 
Um, and another thing to review that some people will sometimes do is they will sometimes go back and watch parts of or all of certain videos if there's particular parts that were causing them trouble. So that's another possibility. All right, some of you, well, most of you have taken tests from before. What am I missing? Yep. Yes, thank you. Our book has probably the best book I've ever seen at doing a chapter summary of all the information. Um, you know, it shows you all the terms that we've seen, all the definitions, um, gives examples of different things. It's really very, very detailed. It's really good. Um, and that's actually listed on the review sheet as well. Thank you for that, Abby. So um, check that out. Make sure, especially as you're writing your note card, that you reference that to make sure that you have all that you want on your note card. And and also, you need to be careful, right? We've done a lot of material, and if you start writing down every definition on your note card, you're going to run out of space. So try to be very selective of what it is that you really need and what you really don't need on that note card. Anything else I missed? I just say, like, go to the studies and just do the exams. There's, like, a lot of classes where, like, the studies are just don't help. But this one, it saves. This one they really help with. It's good to know. Okay. I think Excellent. it's, like, helpful to do the review before you go to the study session so you can go in being, like, Good information. Even if you started your note card. If you wait long. till 9 o'clock on Sunday night and you haven't actually reviewed and you're doing the review session then and you're planning to do it afterwards, you probably waited too late anyway because the test is the next day. So, you know, like 13 hours later or something like that. Probably not the best choice. Okay, let's finish this section then. Thank you for all of that. I appreciate it, guys. All right, um, so our regular polyhedron, um, these are nets for them. So let me talk about what a net is. If you imagined that each of these polyhedron were folded up, say, like with paper, they're paper faces, okay? It's all paper mache or something, I don't know, made out of paper. And you were able to disassemble it by cutting edges down so that it laid flat. It would lay flat because these are all, you know, flat sides. They're poly uh, polygons for the sides, right? If you did that, these are the nets for that shape. They're the folded down flat pieces. So the first one is the shape of a cube. And if you imagine, the dotted lines are where it's folding up and the other pieces, you know, fold over and so forth. So like along this piece, this is a fold actually right here. Um, and it folds around, right? So you get a cube shape out of this. Um, the second one is your tetrahedron. If you imagine folding along the triangle that's dotted in the middle there, it folds up and it makes that top pyramid shape. The octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron are harder to see, but they work the same way. If you folded them and matched up pairs of sides and so forth, you would end up with the shapes that we had on the last slide. So these are the nets, the folded down pieces of them. I believe you have a couple of questions in your homework group work where it gives you a net and it asks you, can this net make this shape? So it's working on that three-dimensional skills stuff for you, which I know I'm not very good at either. So do your best. Try to figure out how it's folding up. Um, if you want, you can actually trace it, and you could cut it out and fold it. That would be a possibility. Yes, Hannah? Um, I tried the homework, and there was one of those. But the one I was confused on, it had numbers on it also. It was like a cube. Yeah. Um, it had numbers on it, and the numbers were in different orders. But could they be, like, I, I actually made it, and I wrote numbers on it. Good. But where I was confused, Yes, they could. So, when they get folded, um, depending on how they're written on there to begin with, if they're folded in such a way, the they could be upside places, down. Okay, they just can't be, like as long as they're yeah, in the same place, even if they're upside down. Yeah, that, I don't think they're, they're trying to make sure that you get the numbers flipped right side up or upside down. They're just trying to make sure that they're on the right face of the cube. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I remember that one as well. Yeah. All right, so these are nets. Um, Euler's formula is very interesting. I suspect you've probably seen this before somewhere. Maybe not, but you may have. This is pronounced Euler. It is not Euler, okay, or Euler or anything like that. It is Euler. Euler's formula says that if you add vertices plus faces minus edges, it will always equal 2. And it doesn't just work for regular polyhedron. It works for any polyhedron, okay, any shape that you'd like. So it's going to work for all of our prisms and all of our pyramids, and it's going to work for um, all the particular shapes that we just did on the past slide. Those are, you know, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. It's going to work for all of them. So let's pick one and check it. So pick one of these shapes, and we're going to check to see that it works. We're going to pick one of the regular polyhedron. Which one do you want to try? Octahedron, the one there in the middle? Yeah. Okay, so this is our octahedron. So you might be having to flip back and forth a little bit to do all the counting. 
But we actually have one of the pieces of the octahedron told already on this piece. There's eight faces, right? So we know one of the three pieces of information. All right, so we're going to do octahedron. There's nothing special about it. Remember, you guys picked it, not me. So the octahedron, we know we have eight faces. Let's figure out how many vertices and edges we have. So how many vertices are there? Can you flip back there and check it out? Do you count them? I think there's six. There, hang on, I'll flip back too so you can see it better. So there are four around the side, like these right here, and there's one on top and one on bottom. I didn't quite hit them with my black ink there, but pretty close. There are six vertices. And then see if you can count the edges up. Are there 12? <coughs> okay. So again, over here, if we're looking at it, we have four edges at slanted around the top, those same four on the bottom, and then we have the four connecting sort of that square-like shape in the middle. So there would be 12. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to check to make sure that when we add vertices plus faces minus edges, we get two. So vertices plus faces minus edges. So there are six vertices plus eight faces minus 12 edges. Six plus eight is? 14 minus 12 is 2. There's a proof for it, but you guys don't really want to see proofs, do you? No. Um, there's some examples in your, um, oh, it's all right. There's some examples in your book where you're going to use it. So just wait till you get to there and you'll see. All right. Two more shapes that we haven't done, and they are not polyhedron. We've seen them last class here, but they're not polyhedron. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Oh, I did. I did that. But we just did one example. Okay. Cylinder and cone. Those are our two shapes. So a cylinder is a simple closed surface that is not a polyhedron. I always love definitions where they say it's not something else. So helpful. Um, it is valuable for you to realize that the bases don't have to be circles. Those are the ones we think of most frequently, but they don't have to be. So you see this sort of awkward looking shape on the very first one where it's not a circle, right? So we would call it non-circular. Again, we're using the word not in front of something that it's, that it's not, which is kind of weird, but that's okay. It's non-circular. So the shape on the bottom, it could be any shape that's not got those flat edges, or at least not all flat edges. So some part of the edges are curved. Circles and ovals and whatever you'd like, funny shapes. Um, the cylinder, what's that? Circular. circular. Yeah. So, it, I mean, hang on. <coughs> I gave an example of any shape that's not circular. It has to be any shape that's not a polyhedron on the bottom. Oh. I think that was your question, actually. Yeah, so we can't have a square on the bottom because then it's a prism. We already have a name for a shape like that. It's all right. Um, the two bases do have to be the same. So whatever awkward-looking shape you have on bottom, it's the same awkward-looking shape on top. Okay? So you see that repeated on this first image. A cylinder has bases that are not polygons with one smooth lateral surface with no edges. Do you see how it's smooth all the way around? And you guys know lots of shapes like this, and most of them are circular cylinders. So give me a couple examples. What? A can? Uh-huh. Yep. A cup? A bucket? You guys are not being very adventurous. How about a paper towel roll? Ooh, yeah, I know, it's more adventurous. Come on. Your water bottles, many of your water bottles are like that. Mine appears not good. A biscuit can. What? Rolling pin, cookies and chew. Okay, we got lots of examples now. Toilet paper, how's that one? Okay, so lots of examples of cylinders. Unfortunately, every time you think of cylinder, you're probably thinking of a circular cylinder, so try to remind yourself that there's no need for them to be circles on top and bottom. Can you think of one that's not a circle on top and bottom? Um, well, well, since we're at Valentine's Day, you can almost make a heart on the top and the bottom, and it works pretty well. And so you'll see some shapes of things where they change it to a heart. It's not exactly perfect, because usually it will have one. See how this says that it has to have no edges? And usually when you create it with a heart, it does. It wouldn't have to, right? I mean, you could create a heart, for instance, that looks like 
that where it's smooth along the bottom and that same shape on top and make a cylinder out of that, that'd be okay. Um, you'd also have to be careful with this particular point right here that you don't get an edge. Um, but you could create something like that and you will see those kinds of objects sometimes too, just not very frequently. Yeah. So the bases, do they have to be the same shape? Yes, they have to be exactly the same shape. So congruent is our word that we've used before, right. All right, so this is cylinders. And our other one is a cone. Oh wait, I already said this, but I didn't actually flip to my slide for it, my bad. The cylinder you know and love is called a right circular cylinder. It's right because it's straight up and down, right? Leaning to our pizza, that's not right. It's leaning. Circular because the base is a circle. So if the base is not a circle, um, we talked about it being non-circular. And if it's not straight up and down and it's tilted, we call that oblique. Okay, and we've seen the word oblique used before with some of our other shapes. If it's straight up and down, it's a right shape. And if it's tilted, right, it doesn't make that right angle. If you connect the top and the bottom center, we're at a, at a slant, that's called oblique. So oblique means slanted. Um, you've probably, well, depending on what kind of uh, mathematics you've had before, if you had an Algebra 2 class, you might have found something called an oblique asymptote or a slant asymptote. Oblique and slant are used interchangeably, and this is, again, an example of that. The word oblique means it's slanted. Okay, I think I've got cone next. Yes. Keep getting ahead of myself. Cone! All right, a cone is determined by a simple closed curve which creates the base, but not a polygon. Again, so no polygons on the bottom. Um, in a plane, and a point not on the plane called the vertex. A cone has one smooth lateral surface with no edges, which is generated by connecting all the points along the curve to the vertex. And then the line segment that is from the vertex down perpendicular to the plane of the base is the altitude. And we saw that word altitude before when we did what shape? Close. Pyramid is what we did it with. Triangles, we would have done it in two dimensions. Yeah, in 3D it was in with pyramids, right? Altitude. Um, in tri or in a pyramids, we called this point at the top the apex. Do you guys remember that? From last time it was called an apex. Here it's not called an apex. It's just the, um, I think they just call it the vertex. Um, but it's the same idea, right? It's this one point that's sort of disassociated with everything else in the plane below, and it connects everything. So we have this kind of a shape. If the altitude intersects the center of a circular base, it's a right circular cone. And if the altitude is not intersecting it, that means it's going to be slanted. It's called an oblique circular cone. And if it's not a circle on the bottom, what do you think we call it? Non-circular. It's like magic, right? <coughs> like magic. Circular, non-circular. So the bottom doesn't have to be a circle. It could be a heart, as long as we're careful. It could be an oval. But it has to, it can't be a polyhedron. But it can't be a polyhedron, because if it were a polyhedron, we'd have a pyramid. Yep, that's why. And you guys have seen cones all over the place. Ice cream cone. Ice cream cone. If you, if you, I mean... There's one cone, ice cream cone, that's really close to a real cone shape. Do you know what it's called? Waffle. No, because a waffle actually has the overlapping pieces. It's closer than a different one. There's three types of cones. Sugar, you guys, sugar. sugar cones are closest. Do you know what the third one's called? Cake cone. It is a cake cone. And I've been at Brahms before. Yeah, McDonald's has them, Brahms has it. And not everybody even behind the counter knows that's what it's called. The flat cone is called a cake cone. All right, so, just so you now all know something new. All right, so a sugar cone is the one that's most closely, you know, fits the real description of a cone. It's got the apex, it's got, and it'd be a right circular cone, right? Okay, so ice cream aside, where else have you seen cones? On the street. On the street. A party hat, that's a good example. Snow cone. A snow cone's a really good example in terms of the shape matching really well. The water cooler, which is a lot, sometimes I like the snow cone ones, right? Okay, you guys are awesome. All right, any questions about these two last shapes? Um, so yes. Even so, there's no edges, right, for cones? Right, no edges. But the Euler <coughs> formula still works technically because you have multiple cones? Well, it doesn't work because you don't have any vertices and you don't have any edges and you don't have the faces. You can't so the count them the same way. Face, like the lateral surface doesn't count as one 
No, we don't even call it a face. Yeah, no. It's a surface, but we don't call it a face because faces are flat. Yeah, good question.